Okay, great. I think that went very well. <laughs> I'll just hang out here until Brooks starts. It looks like Brooks is here. It's awesome. Just like a little show of reactions uh, or maybe even type it in the chat how you feel after just stretching it out a little bit. Hello and welcome back. I am Ava Vanderbeek, the Youth Representative and Student Outreach for the Canadian Rockies Youth Network. Next up, we have an amazing speaker that I'm so excited to introduce. He's an Indigenous lawyer from the Alexander First Nation in Treaty 6 territory, which his great-great-great-grandfather inherited. He is also the Vice President of the Indigenous Bar Association. To students who are new to the subject, he will be explaining Indigenous land and resource issues and the possibility of a new way of managing these issues. As students, it is important that we not just listen, but to think about how we can apply these ideas that he's presenting. We had him speak at our last summit, and we all agreed that he must come back again. So without further ado, Brooks Arkan Paul, everyone. How new to them tick, Kitat Miskatinawa Kakio, Nick Tigawin Sipsis, Kapotaga Ochinia. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I'm just going to queue up my slides. All right, so good morning, everyone. Again, it is an honor to be here, albeit in virtual format today. My name is Brooks Arkan Paul, and I am, my traditional name is Sipsis, which means Little River in Nehiawin, my people's language. I'm from the Alexander First Nation in Treaty 6 territory. I'm calling you today for my traditional territory in Amiskuchi, Wiskaigan, now presently known as Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a lawyer, as mentioned, uh, working as in-house legal counsel to Alexander First Nation, and I'm the current vice president of the Indigenous Bar Association, which is a professional association of over 300 Indigenous lawyers, judges, academics, and students. We advocate for the rights of Indigenous people. In fact, just before this presentation, literally just before this presentation, I had the honor of speaking before the House of Commons and their Standing Committee on Indigenous and Northern Affairs. It has been a long morning to say the least, but again, I am so honored to be here with you today. So what are we here to talk about today? There's me with my picture. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? Well, we are going to look at how parks are legally created and what kinds of access rights we have today with a specific look at how indigenous peoples have been treated within the park system in Canada. So before we begin, I also like to ground my experiences with the parks so far in my life. The first is always having issues with like with having to pay park entrance fees to access my own traditional territory in the parks. This has since changed since I last provided this presentation in 2019, but I will talk about that closer to the end of this presentation. 
In addition to having to pay uh, for my park entrance fees uh, to use my own traditional territory, when I was younger, my kukum and musum, which means my grandma and grandpa in my language, took me to harvest the, at the parks when I was five years old. At that time, and certainly to an extent now, we were not allowed to do this, and I will explain why in this presentation. That was my first introduction to exercising both my Indigenous legal ways along with understanding the Canadian legal structure. Lastly, just like you, I enjoy recreating out in the parks. As you will see, and some of you may recognize, I enjoy recreating in Jasper. And you can see me there with my pup Jake on Lake Beauvert at the Jasper Park Lodge. Beside that photo is Jake standing on some washed up logs in Pacific Rim National Park on Vancouver Island. A cute little guy. So this brings me to refocus on what we are talking about in this presentation. Since we are all in Alberta, I'm going to focus on the parks located in the Rocky Mountains within the confines of our province or adjacent to our province. We have two major parks that this presentation will focus on. Banff National Park of Canada, which is Canada's oldest national park, established in 1885. It encompasses 6,641 square kilometers. The next is Jasper National Park, which was established on September 14, 1907, as Jasper Forest Park. It was granted national park status in 1930. Jasper is the largest national park in the Rockies, and it spans 11,000 square kilometers. Other notable mentions which are relevant to this area are no Yoho National Park of Canada, which was created on October 10th, 1886, along with Glacier National Park, which became the second and third national parks after Banff. The word Yoho is a Cree expre expression for amazement or awe. Last but certainly not least, Kootenai National Park of Canada was created by order and council on April 11th, 1920. The Canadian government at the time agreed with the British Columbian government to build a road from Windermere, BC to Banff, Alberta, with the gov BC government funding from Windermere to the park boundary and border, Vermilion Pass, and the federal government funding from the boundary to Banff. And here's a better picture of, or sorry, here's a bit of context here. We have a copy of the map used by the United Nations Economic, Scientific and Cultural Organization or UNESCO, or UNESCO, which named these parks as a World Heritage Site in 1984. Later on in 1990, three provincial parks, Hamber, Mount Assiniboine and Mount Robson were added to the, uh, were added on as World Heritage Site. And so just for better clarity, here's a better picture. I, I don't know if this thing is gonna you can see past that. Uh, here's a better copy of the map of the parks that have received the World Heritage designation by UNESCO. So you'll see right there, Banff, Jasper, Yoho, and Kootenai. And then you have the three provincial parks, uh, Mount Assiniboine, Hamber, and Mount Robson. So what ex who exactly are the Indigenous peoples who occupied, used, and shared the territory in these areas that we now call parks in Canada? Well, we have many that are still here today accessing the parks for traditional activities. Here we have some examples of the different groups of Indigenous people who access the park. They include the Blackfoot or Nitsitapi, the Cree or Nehewak, the Nakoda Sioux or Ishka, the Stony Nakoda, the Yare Nakoda, Sutana, Tanaha, Sikwapmek, and the Metis. Those are just to name a few. There are rich and vibrant histories within the Rocky Mountain parks. Back in 2019, I had learned about some Métis families that had lived not too far from the Palisades where the conference was in person. Thank you to this, this wonderful uh, summit. I ask you all to ask more questions about the Indigenous peoples who lived here with the land since time immemorial. Another important aspect about where the Canadian Rockies National Park sit are the treaty areas. The main treaty areas that cover the parks are Treaty 6, 7, and 8 which are also the main treaties that encompass the whole province of Alberta. There are small areas in the province that are covered by Treaty 4 and Treaty 10, but there are no First Nations located within that territory, not reserved specifically. Some of you may be familiar with the treaty territories that you may live in, but if you don't, that's okay. If you have a one in three chance of being correct here in Alberta, and if you are not certain, always feel free to ask. The treaties don't just belong to Indigenous peoples, they are yours as well, if you are non-Indigenous to Canada. You may be wondering what that means, and I could do a whole presentation on just that, but to sum up, non-Indigenous people benefit from the treaties as equally as Indigenous people do, namely in that you have the ability to live, 
play, and enjoy the lands that had been previously in the care of the Indigenous peoples who have a treaty with the Crown. The treaties are not just an agreement or a contract to live together. It was a relationship that was intended to last for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. So now on to traditional territories. And that is the first question that is worth a prize, which is a $25 gift card to Mountain Equipment Co-op. I'll be sending these to the organizers to get out to the lucky winner of this gift card. But to be able to receive this, you have to answer the following question correctly. What does traditional territory mean? So I'm gonna just open up to the floor. You can put it in the chat. I don't know if we have the function to be able to um, speak out loud, but Looking for an answer. You can put your hand up if you want to chat. We can unmute you if you don't have the power to do that. Amanda is raising her hand. Just one second. I'm just unmuting. Amanda, you have been asked to unmute. Okay, so I'm guessing there are territories that um, um, the Indigenous people used to live on. Very good answer. That's the right answer. So thank you, Amanda. You won the $25 MEC gift card. All right, so what the definition means uh, here is that traditional territory, also referred as who as Indigenous territory, describes the ancestral and contemporary connections of Indigenous peoples to a geogra geographical area. So this is a legal definition and is one that matters a lot to Indigenous peoples. For example, the Jasper National Park is within my traditional territory, which spans from Jasper south to the Athabasca River, among other areas, northward to Athabasca, south to the Red Deer River, and east to the Saskatchewan border. For great, greater certainty, this is not a legal assertion of where our exact traditional territory is, but it gives you an idea of how many other groups might have larger traditional territories than their, just their small reserve allotted to them. Which is why understanding these territories is so important, legally and socially. Territories may be defined by kinship ties, occupation, seasonal travel routes, trade networks, management of resources, and cultural and linguistic connections to place. Indigenous folks have very deep relationships to the land, and the treaties were intended to share this land together with non-Indigenous folks forever and ever, while also continuing with our activities without being legally barred from doing so. Some examples of how Indigenous peoples access the Rocky Mountains can be seen on this slide. Beyond the more common legally talked about activities such as hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering, we also revered the mountains for the sacredness and conducted ceremonies in and around the mountains. We also use the abundance of natural stones in the mountains for mining to create tools, art, ceremonial uses, and infrastructure. And lastly, we use the mountains for, as gathering places. We still use the parks for all of these purposes, but our ability to do so was affected by the government of Canada, and we are still finding new ways to reconnect, as I will further explain. Since Canada's national parks were first established, their management has required progressive and increasingly detailed legislation. The early park reservations were, were established under sections of the Dominion Lands Act, which is an old piece of legislation. The Rocky Mountains Park Act of 1887 not only created the first national park, but provided during the next 24 years, the authority for its administration and that of several park reserves, which had existed since 1886. Before we get too deep into my favorite part of this discussion, the legal bit, I want to ask, you can feel free to shout out your answer, put them in the chat function. I think probably chat function would probably be easier. What do you like to do in national parks? No answer is a wrong answer. And I'm, unfortunately, this is not a prize one, but I do want to see what you guys say. Yep, skiing, canoeing, hiking, yep. Skiing, lots of skiing, bird watching, very good, yep. Swim, canoeing paddleboarding, mountain biking, camping again. Yep. Very wonderful. Yeah. So these are all, you know, wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for your great answers. To sum up, non-Indigenous Canadians have always, since parks laws have been created, been able to recreate, which includes things such as hiking, camping, 
uh, you know, going to the Bears Paw Cafe in Jasper or going to buy knickknacks like my mom's favorite fudge at the stores. You can also go wildlife viewing if you're so lucky to see some. And all in all, you can do whatever you want in the park as long as you're following the law. That's basically it. And the major theme that the government of Canada, sorry, and the major theme that the government of Canada intended to cover when it passed all of these pieces of legislation were these main areas. Economic development, which included tourism, securing trade routes with the railway and later highways, and providing spaces for wildlife viewing. In the 1970s, there was some environmental concerns and preservation became an interest for legislators to put into law, but that wasn't until the 1970s. Overall though, the parks law pushed indigenous peoples out of the very territories that they had been using since time immemorial, which means forever. As I will show you, Canada did so using the law. While I say this was all done with the law, it is important for you to know that without ethics and knowing rights, law can be a tool that can cause harm. I'm proud to use my legal skills to benefit all Canadians and work very hard to protect the sanctity of the law and to change areas that are still discriminatory today. For example, I spoke to the House of Commons earlier today about changes to legislation that are needed to help make positive change. So the bill providing for the legislation was introduced in Parliament on April 22nd, 1887. And it's going to get a little bit boring, but it's going to get a lot of fun after this. I just have to talk about the law and then we'll talk about fun things right after. So as Honorable Thomas White, Minister of the Interior observed, its purposes were to fix the boundaries of the park and give power to government to adopt rules and regulations for proper order in the park after it is established. As related earlier in this history, the bill generated considerable debate before it received final reading on May 6, 1887. It received royal assent on June 23rd, 1887. So normally when a bill is provided, it is introduced into the legislature, so the House of Commons, or here in Alberta, it's the actual legislature. And then you and then you read through them so that you do three readings and it goes to the next chamber so that in Canada and the federal level goes to the Senate and then it goes to the three readings there and then it receives royal assent by by the blessing I call it the blessing of the Queen or King whatever whoever's in the monarch at the time. So the new act made provision for the management and control of the park by the Minister of the Interior under authority of regulations approved by the governor in council. The act provided for the preservation of the landscape, the protection of wildlife and leasing of lands for living and working, mining within the park, cattle pastures and management of haylands. At this point, most of the permitted activities were for economic develop and resource extraction only. There was zero recognition of indigenous peoples in the scope of this act. And at that time, indigenous peoples were still considered Indians. Um, and that's gonna be a term that I refer to quite regularly. It's still a legal term that people rely on, that they, we use the term Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, or Inuit, uh, to refer to our, our Indigenous brothers and sisters, but under the law, we are still regarded all as Indians. And we're slowly, so as Indians, we were slowly being placed into small reserves allocated to us. Those are specific to the First Nations under treaty. It is from this time in history that our children started being placed in residential schools, and I'm sure some of you do know about those. Our ceremonies were also banned, so a lot of our governance structures that were in our ceremonies were being banned by the government, so we could not organize our, our political and social affairs. And lastly, we were forced to get permission to leave our First Nations through this awful thing called the PASS system. Similar to the apartheid in South Africa, we were not allowed to leave our, our little small parcel of land. Uh, so there, there was, in 1930, the act was replaced uh, by the Fir National Parks Act with the specific provision dedicating to the people of Canada uh, for their benefit, education and enjoyment. And such parks shall be maintained. I think I'm missing a slide here. Oh, here we go, perfect. Uh, and such parks shall be maintained and made use of so as to leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. At this point, we were slowly permitted to leave the reserve, but then came disenfranchisement of our Indigenous status. If we took certain jobs, married certain people, or participated in the military. Throughout this time, we were not permitted to hire a lawyer, let alone become one, to fight for our rights. It is no wonder we were not included in any of these pieces of legislation until relatively recently. 
The only mention that was made to Indigenous peoples was this excerpt. So the governor and council may authorize the minister to purchase, expropriate, or otherwise acquire any lands or interests therein, including the lands of Indians or of any other persons for the purposes of a park. What this means is that the government would be able to go in and take any lands from Indigenous folks to be able to create a park. It still did not recognize that we had an underlying right to use the park as we had been since time immemorial or forever. The Act underwent one final, one last change in 2000 as the Canada National Parks Act, which provided further updates and included this similar line to the 1930 Act, which would dedicate the national parks to the people of Canada for their benefit, education, and enjoyment, and the parks shall be maintained and made use of so as to leave them unimpaired. But most importantly, the updated Act included, for the first time ever in the history of Canada, this line. The Government of Canada finally recognized the traditional harvesting rights of Indigenous peoples in legislation, which is subject, obviously, to a myriad of requirements, but it is enshrined in law to protect the rights of Indigenous peoples accessing renewable resources in the park. Although there is more work that can be done with this right, it is a positive step in the right direction, and we can continue working together to ensure that we are living as was intended under treaty with respect to land management. But that is a presentation for another day. So now to look at some other positive developments that Parks Canada has undertaken to further their relationship with Indigenous peoples in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and these are all small but important initiatives. To the right, you will see a picture of two of my Indigenous access passes that I have received when I accessed Banff and Jasper National Parks in the past year. They've since expired, and I'm not sure whether I can get a new one, mostly because the parks material are not clear on this, but I fully expect to follow up the next time I'm in a park. And that's a really great step to be able, for, to, be able to access the parks as freely and as necessarily as we need to on our traditional territories. In 2015, Parks Canada developed and adopted the parks guiding principles as articulated in Promising Pathways to promote relationship building with Indigenous partners. These principles have since been adapted for use as an evaluation tool by Parks Canada. These principles have since been adapted, oh sorry, members have <laughs> replaced national indicators on Indigenous relations. I'm reading my notes from my lap right now and I'm a little bit blind. Uh, the principles include such items such as working collaboratively with Indigenous partners in heritage place planning, management and operation, and the Aboriginal People's Open Door Program to provide ease of access to community members who have traditional ties with Parks Canada heritage places. The program encourages Indigenous people's reconnection with Parks Canada heritage places by removing park entry fees. And lastly, but certainly not least, Parks Canada works with over 300 Indigenous communities across the country and views Indigenous peoples as partners in the management of Parks Canada's heritage places. The agency's approach to working with Indigenous peoples continue to evolve as the legal and policy environment evolves and the needs and interests of Indigenous partners change. In 2015, Parks Canada released Promising Pathways, the guide to working with Indigenous partners. The agency has made efforts to ensure that this collaborative spirit is embodied in Parks Canada's work as a means of advancing reconciliation through meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples. And I'm not a Parks employee and I'm, I'm not paid by Parks to say that. It's actually just some really good work that Parks have undertaken to include Indigenous folks within their paradigms. The next uh, item that I'd like to talk about is just a little bit of further reading for those that are interested in this topic. So Canada participated in 2010 at the 10th meeting of the Conference of the Parties or COP, COP 10 to the Convention on Biological Diversity in Nagoya, HG Prefecture, Japan, where a strategic plan was plan penned for biodiversity with 20 specific targets for the members to adhere to. Canada adopted the HE targets in 2015 and further committed to, quote, at least 17% of terrestrial areas and inland water and 10% of coastal and marine areas are conserved through networks of protected areas and other effective areas based conservation measures by 2020. This target was recognized by Canada as only being able to be achieved through collaboration amongst government departments, communities, municipalities, Indigenous peoples and others. The Indigenous Circles of Experts was formed 
out of this, along with the National Advisory Panel, to provide advice and recommendations, including through this report, We Rise Together. By the end of 2020, 12.5% of Canada's land and fresh water was conserved. Collaborative efforts continue across Canada, and the completion of announced projects will bring us to an estimated 13.5% by in mid-2021. With additional projects funded and are already underway, we are on track to conserve 17% of Canada's lands and fresh water by 2023. And that was from the project, so the National Advisory Panel. So to quote the report, quote, the ICE report makes a clear turning point in Canadian history. It is an opportunity for all levels of government and Canadian society at large to salvage what is left of the creator's gift and begin to rebuild our natural heritage for future generations. This will require a close re-examination of the dominant narratives about conservation and protection of nature. This dominant, the dominant narratives we refer to have enjoyed de facto, which means just by, by fact of it existing acceptance within existing frameworks about conservation and protection. They have not been fully challenged until now. The Parks Canada Secretariat staff members were indispensable partners in the Indigenous Circle of Experts process. Their willingness to consider new methodologies and critical thought, as well as to ensure Indigenous protocols and practices had the necessary space, has been admirable and commendable. That's directly from the report. So if you wanted to learn more about the process, this is one great way to move forward. Obviously, this is just one of those examples that are out there. There are so many great examples of parks moving together with Indigenous folks, but the underlying question still remains and there's more work that can be done. Um, we made it to the end and there's another double jeopardy doo -doo 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 for a, another gift card. So I have one last question for another $25 gift card to Mountain Equipment Co-op. And this one is hard given all the information I just gave to you. Um, what would be your specific ask from government or Parks Canada to better include Indigenous peoples in the Rocky, Rockies? So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about that. I'm conscious of the time right now. So I'll give you about five minutes to think about that and we'll maybe regroup and, and somebody can give an answer for this gift card. It's pretty high stakes, guys. And you can feel free to put it in the chat or you can also your put your hand up. If I see a hand up, that gets the automatic. You get the first chance to answer. No hands up. I have a question. Like, I have an answer for this. Oh, there was somebody, Maya to everybody um, said, having teepees in the parks. Sean Green to everyone says, better opportunities for engagement. The government is too much in the habit of making decisions without properly engaging Indigenous groups. Another response, Adam Robb, I'm ineligible, <laughs> but he, I'd like to see mandatory sign off on all management plans, I agree. Uh, Sasha Adamova yeah. to everyone. I think it would be super important to educate and encourage more education on these topics. I do not actually know about most of these acts. So I think in the spirit of reconciliation and treaties, I think education would be super important. Yeah. So building it into the curriculum. Alva Snow to everyone, including Indigenous people in the decisions which involve the park. Benjamin Green, Parks Co-Ownership and also Indigenous Participation in Conservation Management. There have been actually some really successful um, implementations of that in Peru um, that I know of. Lakota, Lakota Rob says, I agree with Sasha. Maya J to everyone, hand over land directorship to someone with an Indigenous and an economic background. And yeah, oh my gosh. So those are some really great answers. Uh, and I'm Mallory, I don't think I can, I will be able to pick one. I think what we should do is put the names in a hat and draw out those names because I think that they're all really good uh, perspectives. And I wanted to ask this question because I want to foster some more dialogue on this because it is really important. It's you, you are the youth, you're going to be the ones that really take up the charge. And please keep answering. If you have answers, just please keep answering to put your name, to be able to put your name into the draw. And at the end of the presentation, we'll draw that name for more answers. So you can keep thinking about it. Um, but 
it really is. It does come down to that land management discussion. And we do have examples of that here in Canada. So the most obvious ones that are happening are obviously in areas that don't have these historic treaties. And that's going to be, I'll talk about why that's a problem. Um, but in areas that have modern uh, land claim agreements with the federal government and with the provincial governments or territorial governments where they find themselves, they do have aspects within their agreements to have land management and to co-manage parks and areas. There are works going on. The, the federal government does uh, have the ability to enter into these types of agreements and uh, sharing, agree sharing uh, of land management uh, situations in the parks. But at this point, um, you know, there's not enough. And the problem that I highlighted is that with these historic treaties, a lot of times there's this idea that we had ceded or surrendered our rights to the land. And that's not the case. Our oral testimony and our oral history have told us that we have never given up the right to use our lands or to be on our lands. That is a common misconception and a legal fallacy. So it's false under the law that Canada continues to purport to say that we don't have our rights to the law or sorry, to the parks or to, to make decisions and co-manage the land. What was always intended was that we would use this land together, that we would be able to live in harmony. And that's not been the case. We've always held up our part of the bargain when it comes to treaty and our decision to live together. But unfortunately, Canada and the provinces like to understand that they're, this prov all the land is their domain, which is just not correct under the law. So when we look at examples like the modern agreements in territories up north, and specifically in the Yukon and other places in British Columbia, uh, they have the ability to make decisions in, in the private land in the public lands in the parks to be able to manage those resources appropriately to recognize that we have the ability and we understand using our traditional knowledge on how to preserve uh, ecologically sensitive areas and there's a lot of those in the parks and that's really an important aspect that I want to bring home to you is that we've known how to live with the land it's it's not about managing in the traditional sense it's about living with the land and I know that there are people have been talking about how we talk about that, how we how we reference how Indigenous folks live with the land. It's it's a, a level of stewardship, but it's also recognizing that they are our ancestors. So the land is our ancestor. We call uh, you know various aspects of the land musum or kokum, which means grandmother or grandfather, um, and uh, that's a large part of our cultural understanding. I see a really good long question here. And actually I have a few here that I'm gonna read that I wanna talk about. Um, so we should allow indigenous peoples to use national parks as much as they want for traditional purposes instead of limiting access to these parks. It, that's exactly what we're asking for. But how do we get there? And, and how do we include them and us in decision-making for the parks? Opportunities for indigenous people to share their culture through public festivals and put in more historical monuments. That's a really good one. So that's a really identifying place, recognizing that indigenous folks have lived here, that have they, we've been here since time immemorial. We all live together. And I used this quote earlier today in my presentation to uh, the House of Commons Committee. I actually was not wearing this. I was all suited up and wearing a tie and everything. But we, I mentioned that in the Delgamuk decision, which is a uh, land title uh, decision, the first of its kind that it identified this uh, in British Columbia, the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Lemaire said, let us face it, we're all here to stay. And that's really poignant because we need to know that none of us are going anywhere and we might as well start living together and start recognizing that we share this territory together and that we want to work together and, and live in harmony as was intended under treaty. So, uh, and also with public festivals, you're always invited. You're always allowed to come out to our public festivals. Do not feel like you don't belong. We more than welcome. We always love teaching people about our ways, about our culture, to anyone who will listen, because at the end of the day, how are we going to foster reciprocity and friendship if we're not talking to each other or learning from each other? So Shay says, involving Indigenous people more in education opportunities within the parks. I know whenever I went camping as a kid in the parks, I would learn so much from the educational presentations. And I think it would be really interesting to see more Indigenous perspectives in that, especially since those presentations are targeted towards younger kids most of the time. Very good point. And that's, you know, that's how we get to go, get to live together 
harmoniously is by educating each other, by learning from each other and understanding how our ways relate to each other. It's by me coming to speak to you. And I'm so thankful for you all for listening so intently and being so active in this conversation because it is, it's, it's very important that we educate each other on, on our ways. And for the longest time, Indigenous perspectives have been shut out from these, these abilities to say things and to share our perspective. And we're really working hard to try and, uh, and to re share that reciprocity and share that friendship that was intended. Um, so thank you, Shay, for that question. Sean Green, I wonder if we were to better celebrate Indigenous culture slash traditions in national parks. Could this kind of work be mandated? Yes, I fully agree. This is something we have to ask our legislators to do. That's what I was doing earlier. I wasn't talking about parks, but I was talking about enforcement on bylaws, or sorry, enforcement on First Nations reserves earlier today. And we have to make those requests made. So our legislators don't know what we need on the ground unless we tell them what we need. So if you write to your, your MPs, write to your MLAs that that's something that you would like, because realistically, that's part of our social history and historical fabric. We understand that Canada has been here since time, well, sorry, these lands have been here since time immemorial. Canada has been here in a short period of that time, but we also have to celebrate the fact that it wasn't just once, once settlers came here that Canada came into existence. This land has been breathing and living for as long as we know. Uh, Tanvir says, I think it's important to make sure that the Indigenous individuals get a say in these decisions, as often these are lands being taken over and used for recreation purposes with the exclusion of, uh, of opinions. Often the land holds much more meaning and stripping it away is like taking away their identity and culture. Also incorporating more information like this in the provincial education systems and informing individuals at younger ages. Oh, yeah, that's a very loaded one and certainly one that here in Alberta, you know, curriculum and learning has been a very hot topic. When we ask our, our decision makers, our, our politicians to include this kind of thing, we need to make sure that we hold their feet to the fire. We have to make sure that they're, they understand that that's something that we need to be able to live together and to, to include Indigenous voices. That's my biggest piece that I always advocate for is listening to community and acting upon what they're telling you rather than just saying that they that the government knows best. The government does do an important and vital role, but we need to change the way that Indigenous folks work within that. I had some really I heard some really great testimony from the standing committee earlier today about how exactly we go about that. And at the end of the day, it's the people, it's the grassroots people, and that's the same for non-Indigenous uh, governments. It's the grassroots people that really are the power. They are the ones that get to dictate how things happen. So making sure you vote, making sure you're pu publicly engaged, writing to your ministers or your MLAs, and just being vocal, attending protests, listen, being able to exercise your democratic rights to speak, to be able to make changes that need to happen. Sean Green is restating, uh, should national parks be mandated to celebrate and promote Indigenous culture? I, yes, I think I spoke to that. I think that that's correct. Uh, we should, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be mandated. They should be able to do so. I, I think what we're trying, what you're trying to get at is, should there be specific legislation to deal with um, celebrating and promoting Indigenous culture? It wouldn't hurt, uh, especially for non-Indigenous folks that might not understand uh, that that's a necessary requirement, uh, but it should be up to the non-Indigenous folks to also do so. I know when government starts interfering with how we relate to each other, then that can cause problems. Uh, but it is certainly something that can be mandated, mandated either by policy or Parks Canada willingness. And they've shown really great work on, on doing so. So Ainsley Chong says, Indigenous people should be able to control any activities that are happening on the land. Yes, that is a very, very good point. And I think that that's restated through uh, some of the questions. We should be able to say what is happening on our land. I didn't get to talk about traditional territory, and I'm really glad that this question is posed. And now that I'm at this thought process and I'm conscious of time, I'm watching. Mallory's going to send me a little note uh, once I'm up. But 
we, traditional territories overlap. So my traditional territory is expansive as it is that it goes from Jasper all the way to the Saskatchewan border, all the way up to the Athabasca River, all the way down to Red Deer River. But there are overlapping interests in those areas. So Alexis Nakota Sioux has an interest in the traditional territory. And we need to have some framework that we all can talk about. Remember, we all lived here together before settlers came and we have our ways of, of interrelating and we need to get back to those governance systems. Okay, so Raven Simpson, uh, land co-ownership and the allowance to give Indigenous perspectives to be publicly announced, the celebration of Indigenous land and culture. Yes, fully, land co-ownership, land, land management, working together so that we can build a prosperous future in the future. Uh, Sasha Andromova, uh, absolutely agree with all the points here. Education, celebration of culture, and even just more legal protection would come very far. Um, Maya, I think... I think I'm running out of time and I do want to just address some of these. If Do we have any questions here? Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I, I'm sorry for all of the folks that have put forward uh, their suggestions. So Maya J will make sure that your name is in that draw if you're a student. Skylar Boissonneau, Amanda, um, Adam, I know you're not a student and hello again, Adam, nice to see you. Uh, Sasha, also it is really disappointing that national parks are really advertised and perceived as a very white thing, along with just general environmentalism. It is super important for people to start recognizing Indigenous leaders and really just the culture and traditional knowledge in the park. And what a great way to end this portion of my presentation because you're going to hear about some really fantastic work that is happening uh, in between environmentalists and with Indigenous uh, land protectors next. And the next presentation, I've had the honor to speak alongside Latasha Kafrobe and my really good friend, I would say my best friend Becky Bespert Whistle who works uh, at a CPAWS. Latasha uh, is the one of the uh, leaders of the Nitsitapi Water Protectors and they're doing phenomenal work uh, around uh, preservation and conservation but also advocacy. So we're not silent, we're not a silent people and you can probably surmise that from a lot of the work that we do. We're very active and we, we do care very deeply about our ancestors, which is the water, uh, which is the land, which are the mountains. And you got to see that I'm, I'm wearing a Protect Our Wild Places shirt that CPAW's uh, campaign worked very hard. And I have my, uh, uh, our, my sign by CPAW's out front my house. It hasn't left since I put it up. And they're really starting to be open to that, to recognize that environmentalism sometimes is very white. It doesn't take into perspectives, the indigenous uh, perspectives. We're getting a long way to, to working on that relationship. And I see these uh, relationships being fostered right in front of my eyes. One an, Another example of where CPAWS is doing really good work was at, with the Nacho Nyak Dun case. Uh, I'm, I think I pronounced it wrong, but Nacho Nyak Dun in the Yukon Territory, where the Peel watershed was being uh, dealt with uh, by the Yukon government, and they didn't include the Nacho Nyak Dun nation in their I think I, I think that's time. So I will I will take no. A, oh no. <laughs> I wasn't trying to cut you off, Brooks. I was trying to let somebody in. So continue. Sorry okay, to break so, your pattern. <laughs> so back to Nacho Nakdan. Thank you, Mallory. Uh Nacho Nakdan. So they the Peel watershed was being determined, uh, a decision was being made on it, but within the agreement, uh of that Nacho Nakdan had under the umbrella final agreement and their own separate final agreement with the, pro with the territory and Canada was that they were supposed to be given the ability to uh, make decisions on the river and how the watershed would be developed or protected. They were not. And ultimately all of the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada said that, hey, you have to include them in the decision-making. The agreement says you have to. And in that situation, they were, it, the decision was reversed to deal with the Peel watershed. And then it went back to redetermination because the Nacho Nyak had to be involved along with other indigenous groups to be able to make those decisions for that watershed and for the protected areas that it, would, that it encompassed. So there are really great examples of this being done. And that litigation was actually... Uh, you uh, um, partnered with CPAWS Yukon and they did some really great work and now we have really great uh, 
decision making or sorry decision out there from the Supreme Court of Canada that deals with this issue. So um, I see one last question here, Tanvir. Sorry, I was just reading Warren's as well. So Tanvir, also what, what is happening with the Wet'suwet'en First Nations in British Columbia with the pipeline, which is still being proceeding despite all the blockades and protests? And so I have about two more minutes, so I'll talk on this very quickly. So for those that aren't aware of Wet'suwet'en, uh, there was a big, uh, I guess, confrontation and, and protest last year, around February of last year, just before the pandemic hit. And a lot of people forget about it because the pandemic kind of overtook everything and, and what happened. So I'm really glad that this question ha uh, is popped up. So the, the last that I had heard was that the, the traditional, so the issue was between traditional uh, hereditary chiefs and the Indian Act Band Council that was in place uh, for, for Nistoten, uh, which was part of Wet'suwet'en. And the traditional hereditary chiefs were the ones on the land that were protesting the development of um, the uh, pipeline. And in that situation, they were asserting that no pipeline should go through their traditional territories without consultation with them or whatsoever. Where it's at right now is that there was an agreement in principle to move that forward. But the last I had heard actually was that there was a, there was a, a hummingbird, a specific type of hummingbird that was in the way of the pipeline, it's like breeding grounds and it's, it's nesting grounds, were in direct, uh, uh, direct uh, way of the pipeline. And because of that, they had to put the development on pause. So that's the last update that I heard. But with respect to the wet sweat, and that issue still remains uh, outstanding. The wet sweat and hereditary chiefs are saying that they still have not uh, been included in that agreement in principle, even though they have been. And the issue, real core issue in that one um, is not only just conservation, but it's how we interrelate with internally with ourselves uh, as Indigenous people and our governance system. So it's very, it's a very complicated issue uh, and certainly not one we're going to see resolved in the next couple of weeks or months, but it is one that will be determined internally by the wet sweat and themselves uh, through their own governance mechanisms. And with that, I will say uh, thank you for listening to me today. And I will be sending those Mac gift cards as soon as I get off the phone here and we'll, uh, I look forward to watching the rest of your conversation. Hi, hi, and ask one. And Brooks, if you just stop doing the screen share, I'll be able to share my screen and we can just do that draw here. Random name picker. On, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's on. Yeah. Sorry, I thought it was yeah. moving together in a good way. Hi hi Nas, come on. Thank you so much, uh, Brooks and <laughs> Mally for running that. Fun. I'd also uh, like to say congratulations to Sasha and Amanda for uh, winning those gift cards. That's awesome. Uh, if we all wanted to, I have one more thing um, that I'd like to, I guess, everybody in this meeting to do. So in the chat right now, I'm posting a link to another um, poll. And I think it's, uh, it'd be cool to see, I guess, what everybody's final thoughts are from Brooks, Brooks's uh, presentation today. Yeah, so just log on to that. There's only three questions.
Thank you so much, Brooks. That conversation at the end there was amazing. And thank you for those gift cards. You did not have to do that, but it sure makes the conversation a bit more lively. So at our last summit, we had the privilege of visiting a Métis homestead where the family was pushed off their land for the creation of a national park. Um, we got to see firsthand uh, what the Canadian National Parks Act did to the people that Brooks talked about. I know that we are moving forward to incorporate Indigenous views into conservation, as Brooks described, but we as youth have to continue this progress. We must make sure that these amazing voices are not lost. So if you feel inspired, uh, then start an action project with more Indigenous views. Check out our Instagram and learn more about how you can start a hop into action project where you can include more Aboriginal views. And I'll let Alex take it from there. Hey guys, thanks so much for coming. Um, so we're gonna be breaking now for our lunch break. We'll be gone for um, about an hour to have a nice um, either plant-based or um, waste-free lunch. And if you choose to have a plant-based or waste-free lunch, you can take a photo of that and um, t make sure you tag us as well as Lake Louise Ski Resort and the Biosphere Institute in your post um, to earn 50 points as part of our action project challenge. So with this challenge, First, you need to create a post on Instagram explaining um, why you um, love the Canadian Rockies and what it is that you love about it. Sorry about that. Um, and once you create that post, and you can find all these rules for this on our Instagram page, um, you'll earn points. And then throughout the summit, we're going to have a variety of challenges, um, some of which are as simple as just posting what we've been doing, what you've learned in sessions. Um, there's other projects you can do, things like eating this lunch, taking a photo. And once you post these challenges, um, that we're doing, it's going to allow you to earn more and more points. Now, from this, you're entered in draws to win amazing prizes. Um, our top prize is a guided hike for your family donated by Lake Louise Ski Resort, which is going to be pretty amazing. And we have a ton of other prizes. There's some prizes from Patagonia, prizes from um, other donors. We have toques, we have swag, we have stuff from the Biosphere, we have tons of stuff. It's going to be really exciting. So we're super happy to do that. And I guess, yeah, without any further ado, we have some amazing sessions coming up and we can't wait to see you guys all in an hour after our lunch break. So thanks guys.